Hello, in this video we're going to be talking about the math and physics of heat transfer. Um, how much energy transfers from one object to another when we have heat flowing between them. And we're going to talk about it in two ways, in terms of changing temperature and in terms of changing phase. So we could, for example, calculate how long it might take an ice cube to melt. All right, just as a recap, this is a slide from the last set of uh, notes that we looked at. Um, but we're always thinking about two forms of energy when we're talking thermal physics. So we're talking about a substance and we're thinking about the microscopic properties of the molecules or atoms that make it up. And there's two main pieces. The first is phase. That would be the macroscopic property, the property of the actual big picture water. And we understand phase by thinking about the potential energy of the microscopic molecules that make it up. The intermolecular potential energy. This has to do with their chemical bonds. And more or less, we want to think about it just as how close together the molecules are. So if they're very close together as in a solid, uh, there's a little bit of potential energy. If they get a little further apart in liquid form, there's more potential energy. And even further apart as a gas, uh, there's a lot of potential energy. So we can increase potential energy and that would change phase or we can increase the random kinetic energy and that will change temperature. Keep in mind only one of these things ever happens at a time. And so we're gonna look at those in two ways. We have an equation that'll tell us um, how heat can change temperature and we have an equation that will tell us how heat can change phase. Uh, the energy that we put in a substance can be used to increase one of these two types of energy. Only one at a time though. So the first one we'll look at is changing temperature. And every substance has a property uh, which we'll call heat capacity or thermal capacity. So different substances take different amounts of energy to heat them up. The idea is if you say, put your hand on a cool wheat glass window, uh, you feel it, it feels cool to the touch pretty much right away. But if you leave it there for a minute or so, it'll heat up and then you won't really feel it so much anymore because your hand and the window will reach thermal equilibrium. So you can pretty quickly heat the glass, at least the part that you're touching, up to be about the same temperature as your hand. And it'll pretty rapidly heat up as you touch it. And then when you take your hand away, it'll pretty rapidly cool down. Uh, glass has a relatively low comparatively thermal capacity. So it doesn't take a ton of energy to heat it up, so it'll pretty quickly do that. Whereas if you dunk your hand in a glass of ice cold water, you're really not going to get that water up to like 90 degrees, which is the temperature of your hand. It would take a very long time uh, and your fingers would be pruny uh, and, and freezing cold before you reasonably could heat that water up because water has a very high thermal capacity. It takes a lot of energy to heat water up. Um, and so water has a very stable uh, thermally in terms of its temperature. This is uh, a big part of uh, the benefit of having your body being comprised of mostly water. The fact that you have your organs and stuff are, are watery and kind of swimming in water. Um, it, your whole body is very stable in terms of temperature. So your body temperature is pretty stable because it takes a lot of energy to really change the temperature of water. Um, okay, so thermal capacity is how much energy it takes to raise the temperature of a thing, an object, by one Kelvin. The number we care about much more often is called specific heat capacity. So regular heat capacity is just for one given object, which is not super useful. Uh, specific heat capacity, though, is more in terms of the material because it's per unit mass. So in other words, it's going to be per kilogram. So I could say, if I have a penny made of copper, how much energy it's going to take me to heat that penny up and change its temperature by one Kelvin. But that's specific for a penny. Uh, it's usually much more useful to know how many joules does it take to heat a kilogram of copper up? And then you can apply that to any uh, type of copper substance that you're looking at. So specific heat capacity is gonna be in terms of the unit mass. So it's gonna be per kilogram. So it's a little more generic and useful.
All right, so unit, whenever you see stuff like this, unit mass, unit charge, if you remember that, it means one. Uh, so unit mass is uh, one kilogram. So the units here are going to be joules per kilogram per Kelvin because it's the energy per mass to raise it by one kilogram, one Kelvin. Uh, a lot of times when we look at these values, uh, you will also see them in joules per gram per Kelvin. Many times we're dealing with smaller quantities and a lot of times they're expressed this way. So you have to be careful if you're given joules per gram per Kelvin, you're going to need to convert to kilograms or use grams in the masses. And we start looking at this mass, math, just be careful. Make sure that you're being very consistent with your units. Think about what units are coming in and what units you're going to get out. All right, so here is the equation from the data booklet for specific heat capacity. And it's all about Q. Q is about heat. So the energy that it takes to change the temperature of a substance is given by this equation. Q is the amount of thermal energy transferred to the object or from the object when it changes its temperature. If I transfer that ob energy to the object, it's going to heat up. If that object is cooling down, it's going to be giving off that thermal energy. But either way, I have a change in temperature, which is delta T, which will do final minus initial. M is the mass of the substance changing its temperature, and C is the specific heat capacity of that object. So you can see here that this has to be joules per Kelvin per kilogram in order for me to get thermal energy in joules here. One thing to be careful of, we're going to be using Kelvin a lot, and there is, of course, a conversion between Kelvin and Celsius. It's in the front of the data booklet if you need it. Um, in a lot of areas, it's important to make sure that we work in Kelvin when we're dealing with absolute temperatures in our equations. You do not need to do that for specific heat capacity problems because we're looking at a change. We're looking at delta T. So because of the way that these scales work, um, the temperatures, the absolute temperatures are different in Celsius and Kelvin, but because we're dealing with a change, an increment of one Celsius is the same as an increment of one Kelvin. In other words, if you change your temperature by 10 Celsius, you've also changed your temperature by 10 Kelvin. It's just instead of going from 10 to zero, you might be going from 283 to 273 but you've changed by the same amount. So delta T, you never have to convert. If you have numbers in Celsius, it's totally fine to use those as long as you're dealing with delta T. One other good trick you can do for these, we're gonna be doing Q uh, to find the energy, the amount of energy that gets transferred from one place to the other. A lot of times you're gonna see problems where they say, there's a hot plate and the hot plate has a power of a thousand watts. And you have to figure out some things based on that. You put a beaker of water on a hot plate, say, and boil it. And they'll give you the power, the amount of energy per unit time provided by the hot plate or the heater or whatever. So you need to know, based on what power is and definition-wise, that you can do this. You can, of course, take the power and multiply it by time to get the amount of energy. So if you know you have a 1,000-watt heater and it runs for five seconds, a thousand joules per second times five seconds means you've transferred 5,000 joules of heat to the substance. So this is not in the data booklet. You are definitely expected to know that you can do this because you should have deep within your heart a good understanding of what power is in terms of energy. All right, so that's the amount of energy that it takes to change the temperature. So in that aspect, we're looking at the random kinetic energy, the vibration of these molecules, heating something up, cooling it down in terms of its temperature. The other way that thermal energy can be used is to change phase. And that's all about specific latent heat. So this is very similar, but it's the energy that it takes to change the phase of one kilogram of a substance. And this happens, remember, without changing its temperature. Whenever there's a phase change, the temperature does not change. So if ice is melting, the ice melts, turns into water, all the ice and all the water throughout that process is at zero Celsius the whole time. There's no change in temperature at all. You're just melting and changing the bonds. So this one is just going to be joules per kilogram. It's just how many joules of energy does it take to melt a kilogram of ice, for example. There are two different uh, types. It's 
going from liquid to gas, number wise, is not quite the same as going from solid to liquid. So you're going to have different types of latent heats. There's a latent heat of vaporization. Vaporization, think turning into vapor, so like boiling, or going backwards and condensing. So this would apply to going from a liquid to gas or going from a gas to a liquid. So boiling or condensing, you would use this value. And the latent heat of fusion um, is about liquid to solid or solid to liquid. All right, here's the equation in the data booklet. Q again is the heat, so it's the amount of thermal energy transferred to the object if we're trying to say melt it or boil it, or from the object if it's say freezing or condensing. M is the mass of the object changing its phase. L is the latent heat. So just to give you uh, some example numbers, of course you'll be provided any numbers like this that you might need, but for water, uh, we can see it takes about 340,000 joules to, say, melt a kilogram of water. And it takes about 2.3 million joules to, say, boil a kilogram of water. I guess I should say melt a kilogram of ice. But so you can see how much energy it takes to change the phase of one kilogram of a given substance based on these. And of course, we also have the temperatures that that, where that happens. So... We hopefully know ice will melt and water will freeze at zero and water will boil or gas or water vapor will condense at 100 celsius all right so putting that all together again remember only one of these things will happen at a time so you need to decide if heat is transferring between two objects because they have a difference in temperature what's that heat going to do is that heat going to increase the temperature of this other object is it's going to change the phase and sometimes both will happen but then you have to do it in multiple steps so a good example that they like to give is you like fill a beaker with ice and you put it on a hot plate and so the beaker is going to start to melt the ice and then the ice cold water will heat up but you have to do them one at a time so you would first figure out how much energy it takes uh, to melt all the ice using the latent heat equation. The first bit of energy that goes in then, all of that energy is going to go to melting the ice until you have melted all of the M. And once you've done all of that, now you have ice cold water at zero degrees. Now the water will start to heat up. You would then switch to mc delta t to describe what's going on the temperature is changing and any energy added is going to change the temperature and if you kept going you would heat it up to 100 so you could figure out how much energy it takes to do that you could maybe figure out how long it takes then depending on what they give you in the problem if they talk about the power and then if you go further if you start to boil the water then that further thermal energy would go towards boiling the water and you go back to this so this would be a long one. This would be like a three-step problem. We would first have to figure out this, then separately figure out this, then separately figure out this. So always break it up if you need to. Uh, all right, a phase change graph is what we'll see a lot. And this is kind of this idea that let's say I start with cold ice and I can start heating it up. Um, so you'll see a lot of these temperature versus time graphs where I'm heating a solid substance and it's getting warmer and warmer and warmer until it reaches the melting point. So this would be the melting point right here, this temperature, because here I'm heating it up, heating it up, changing the temperature until I eventually get to this point. And now that heat, that energy that's being transferred is going to go towards changing the phase. So again, this is like a solid object on a hot plate or something, maybe ice on a hot plate in a beaker and as time goes on energy is still being added but the temperature is going to stay constant while the phase change happens so here you would use q equals ml to describe how much energy it takes to change the phase of that mass of ice remember we could do power times the amount of time uh, to get that q uh, we're putting delta t here because you wouldn't just put the time at the end you would have to figure out how much time passes from here to here. And then this is just the other way we can think about these two uh, areas. 
whenever I have an increasing temperature, that means the kinetic energy of the molecules, the random kinetic energy is increasing, and the potential energy is constant because it's in a certain phase. And in these sections, the flat sections where I am changing phase, the temperature is constant, so the kinetic energy remains the same. And all that's happening is the molecules are getting further apart as I change them from solid to liquid, or in this case, liquid to gas. So this is a really good conceptual graph that you want to spend some time with and really think over. If you really deeply understand this graph, you have a very good grasp of this whole subtopic, really. Um, you can do almost everything that you need to do in this whole subtopic by thinking about and using this graph. There's some fancy stuff you can do. One thing you can think about is what would the slope of this line represent a change in temperature over time? That's something that they've had you use before and something that you will surely uh, practice. All right, so the idea of calorimetry, of taking measurements and figuring things out about objects and their, their heat capacities, uh, involves having two or more objects who exchange heat. So I can take a warm object and get it next to a cool object. And we remember that heat will transfer from warm to cool. Heat will transfer across a temperature gradient until we hit thermal equilibrium. So again, depending on what's happening, whether object B is maybe melting or object B is maybe just increasing its temperature, I can figure out certain things about these materials. All right, here's the equation that you're going to use anytime you see a problem with like heat transfer. Energy loss plus energy gained equals zero. This is conservation of energy. The total change in energy has to be zero. So however much energy is lost, say, by object A must be equal to the amount of energy gained by object B in like an absolute value sense. The energy loss plus the energy gain must be zero. There's no change. So the practical way you're going to set these up most of the time is Q lost equals Q gained with a negative sign. And you could put it on either side. A sketch and being able to chart what's going on with the energy is really helpful. All right, so we'll look at some examples here. In this case, let's say I have a warm object and a cool object. And this could be your hand in the window or something. And so you touch the window and your hand will transfer heat to the window until they hit the same temperature. And so you have to think conceptually about what's going on heat wise. Um, probably, hopefully your hand is not melting. I think your hand or freezing. I think your hand is just cooling down and same idea. I think the glass of your window is just heating up. So it's a change in temperature both times. So this Q, the thermal energy that's uh, leaving your hand, What's going to happen is your uh, hand is going to change temperature. It's going to decrease in temperature. And the same for the window. The Q that goes to the window is going to cause the temperature of the window to increase. So what we would do for this equation was use MC delta T both times. This is how much energy leaves your hand. This is how much energy goes to the window. Object A, object B. This would be a very simple one where you just have two objects in contact, one cooling down, one heating up. They would change, uh, they would gain or lose the same amount of energy. Again, conservation of energy. But since Q has all three of these terms in there, it can really vary. And since your hand has a really high specific heat capacity compared to the window, even though these two sides of the equation are the same, Delta T for your hand will be much less than delta T for the window. You know, the window might heat up 20 or more degrees, uh, like Fahrenheit. Your hand, though, really won't change its temperature by much at all because the C for your hand is much greater than C for the window. And probably the mass of your hand touching the window is greater than the part of the window that you're touching. So all of these things combined. So it, it is very rarely the case that the changes in temperature are the same. It's the energy that's the same, so you need to use this to solve. But say you know the mass of your hand, the mass of the window, 
and the specific heat capacity of your hand and the specific heat capacity of glass, you could figure out what temperature the tube will hit and, and stabilize at. All right, so calorimetry, uh, you will see and, and use uh, this device, which is called the calorimeter. And this is something that's used to analyze the heat capacity of different objects. Um, what this is, is an insulated device. So usually it's something like this. This is an aluminum cup. And the blue that you see here is insulating material. So the blue is an insulator that is in a perfect world going to completely insulate everything inside from the surroundings. So it really will make sure that there is all of the energy transferred stays inside of the calorimeter. Usually what we do is an experiment. We'll look at a problem here as an example where uh, you have this filled with water and you take a hot object, um, oftentimes like a piece of metal that you've heated up and you drop it inside of here, the metal will cool down as it gives its energy to the water and to the cup. And you can measure the change in temperature and you can use that to figure out basically the specific heat capacity of the metal or any other thing that you're trying to find. All right, so we're assuming that all of the energy stays inside here. Now in practice, there is always some energy lost to the surroundings. This is as good of an insulator as this is, there's gonna be a little bit of heat that escapes into the universe. And so from the IB's perspective, they usually just want you to be able to talk about this being an assumption. A lot of times they'll give you a calorimetry problem and they'll just, they'll just say, state an assumption that you made in problem A. And you say, I assume there was no heat loss to the surroundings. All right, so just know that that's something we're usually doing with these. We're assuming no heat is lost to the surroundings. You could and sometimes will be asked to account for that. And you just need to think about then in a conservation of energy sense, what happens if some of that heat, say 10 joules, escapes the calorimeter? How's that going to change your values? So again, using Q lost and Q gained, you'll need to account for that. So sketching an energy flow is, is really, really, really good for that. All right, now we're going to take a look at a practice problem. We will uh, basically work through this one together. There are many good problems out there uh, provided for you, but we'll go through the process together here. This is a classic calorimetry problem. Uh, basically that process we just described where we're going to take a small iron cube and put it in boiling water and let it sit there for a couple minutes so that we are confident it has reached thermal equilibrium which means if i put this thing in boiling water it's eventually going to reach the same temperature as the boiling water so i know i have a hundred degrees celsius cube of iron i can then drop it into that calorimeter so let's say I have 250 grams of water in the calorimeter, that's 20 degrees, and I stir, and what's gonna happen is you drop this hot piece of metal into water. It's The water's gonna heat up, the metal's gonna cool down, and they are themselves gonna reach thermal equilibrium. They're gonna hit some final temperature together. These would be the values that the problem gives us then. We have the specific heat capacity of all three things because we do have three things in our system. All right, so here's how we have to think about it. Um, let's say this is the calorimeter. So this is the insulator. So we're assuming that everything happens within here. I drop in an, a cube of iron and the iron cube is hot. So heat transfer wise, the cube is gonna give off some energy and give some thermal energy to the water. And it's also gonna give some thermal energy to the iron, uh, sorry, to the aluminum cup. So I'm going to have to account for both of those. Some energy is going to the water. Some energy is going to the aluminum cup. So if I think about it like this, energy lost and energy gained, I have three objects I care about. The iron block, the water in the cup, and the cup itself. The idea is the iron block is the only thing losing energy, and both the water and the cup are gaining energy and everything is staying in its same phase so I'm, in this problem i'm just dealing with changes in temperature 
the iron cube cools down temperature wise, the water heats up, the cup heats up. So here's what this problem will look like then. This term represents the iron cube losing some thermal energy and changing its temperature. This is the water changing its temperature and this is the cup changing its temperature. So all the energy given off by the iron block is absorbed by both the water and the cup together. All right, and don't forget the negative sign here. Uh, the math gets a little wonky because uh, we're going to have finals minus initials and we'll have to distribute, so just be careful with that. But if you put a negative sign in front of either side of the equation, things will work out fine because we're essentially, again, doing conservation of energy. There's no real total change in energy, assuming no heat loss to the surroundings. All right, once you get this part, it uh, becomes mostly a plug and chug type of problem. There's a few things we want to be able to do. Um, mainly those change in temperatures are always final minus initial. That's how we always do a change. So I can do, for example, here, I'm using I for iron, W for water, C for cup. So the final temperature of the iron block minus the initial temperature of the iron block is what this is showing. Final temperature of the water, initial temperature of the water. You can, of course, write these however you like as long as you're keeping track of things and communicating clearly. Um, but the real trick to this, the last bit of like physics that we need to put in here is this idea that they're all going to hit the same final temperature. We wait a couple minutes and the water, the block, and the aluminum cup will all be at the same temperature, which we know will be somewhere between 20 and 100 degrees. So the final temperature of the cup, the final temperature of the water, and the final temperature of the iron are all the same. So if we can bring that bit of knowledge to this equation, I can just call them all T. And T is what I'm solving for. So you can see then that this will become an exciting algebra problem where we need to move stuff around to solve for T. At this point though, the physics work is basically done. Now it's just a math problem. All right, so here is the solution to the math problem. I'll go through it quickly. Feel free to pause for as much algebra help as you might need. Uh, one good trick that usually happens with these, since I have the negative sign here, you can kind of quickly deal with that just by flipping these terms. I'm basically distributing negative one in here, uh, and then things become a little easier. At this point, you would probably plug in values. Be careful with grams. So. 250 grams is going to be 0.25 kilograms because again this number has kilograms built in so we want to be careful with that anyway these are a little bit time consuming because you need to distribute collect your like terms but you should solve this and get 35 celsius so take your time working through the math there but that is how you set these up all right so there you go that is how we uh, are going to start dealing with problems in math where you figure out how much energy gets transferred from one to the other, calorimetry. There will be many practice problems uh, available to you so that you can start honing these skills. Have fun.